There are a whole bunch of questions about Zika. There's so much we don't know about Zika. There's a lot of things that we just don't know yet. At this point, I think there's going to be a lot more needed research. What is going to be the impact? But what happens legally? What if it's not the mom that's bitten? What if it's the dad that's bitten? Does it have carry the same exact risk? How much can the mosquito change? This is not very well understood at this point. It does it impact me personally? Not that much is known about how the vector handles being in these very dry places. Uh, and I don't believe that we know that answer yet. These present really difficult legal issues. Why is it now causing microcephaly? What is happening to individuals who don't have babies with microcephaly but were infected during pregnancy? How does it impact future travel? We had a hell of a lot more questions than we did answers. Um, and On February 1st, 2016, the World Health Organization declared Zika a public health international concern. Throughout the world, the Zika virus took the media's front page, communicating to the population the devastating and horrifying effects of an infection. No one knew the complexity of the virus, but in less than a year, the many discoveries led to even bigger questions. Throughout this video, experts discuss what they know and what they don't know about the Zika virus. Zika is a um, virus that is transmitted by the bite of a mosquito called the Aedes aegypti mosquito. Uh, that mosquito is ubiquitous. It's found everywhere. It does cause microcephaly. Uh, it can be sexually transmitted, and this is a little unusual from most of the other mosquito-borne diseases. Typically, an infection just causes relatively mild symptoms. Many people are completely asymptomatic. Uh, it can cause fever, rash, aches and pains. Uh, it really becomes problematic though in pregnant women where it can affect the fetus and cause microcephaly. We only consider Zika as a diagnosis or as a possibility when we have that symptom complex in the presence of somebody who has a positive travel history or a sexual exposure history to someone who has had a positive travel history. That's when we think about Zika virus. I, if I describe this biologically, so this would be sort of a single-stranded, an RNA, um, enveloped virus that fits in the family of what we call flaviviruses and some examples of the other viruses in this family include yellow fever, dengue, uh, West Nile, Japanese encephalitis. Zika ha causes profound, um, a very, very devastating um, birth defect called microcephaly where the brain doesn't grow and therefore the cranium doesn't develop. That's probably one extreme presentation of that, there's probably a whole spectrum of things that may fall short of actual microcephaly but may be more functional. The known effects of Zika in babies are extremely devastating. However, the link between microcephaly and Zika was not always clear. A few months back, the link was uncertain. We don't know yet exactly the link. We know there were increased reports of microcephaly in Brazil at the time where we start to see Zika transmission. So there's a strong correlation, but exactly how this occurs, um, is there encephalitis? That, that part is still being evaluated and sort of being researched. And I'm hoping you know, that we get more information because microcephaly is not unique to, to Zika. At this point, I think there's gonna be a lot more needed research to know exactly how this occurs. Uh, several studies now linking, making the link between microcephaly and Zika more firm. Um, one of them was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which identified, um, you know, a, a Zika virus involving the placenta, and definitely uh, we know now that um, it affects pregnant women. In addition, uh, we have a better understanding that the virus is neurotropic. Uh, it has a sort of a predilection for the uh, brain and the central nervous system and brain stem. So if a child is born and in that first year of life gets infected with the Zika virus, there's still a lot of rapid brain development that's occurring in the basically the first three years of life. And what is happening to children's um, brain development if they're getting infected in sort of those first three years of life? Is there any impact at all? Um, is it going to result in some sort of uh, neurological difficulties for those children? I know that there's been some evidence in, in laboratory mice that even adult mice that are infected have some neurological damage that's occurring. Especially
What started in Brazil mid-2015 has now spread to over 70 countries. However, the majority of the cases still prevail in Brazil. But why? The reason that, that this has happened so quickly uh, in, uh, and that it happened so quickly in, in Brazil, uh, so quickly got out of control, is you had a, a combination of three things. You had urban density, um, which we quite don't have. You had a mosquito density, which again, even though we have the 80s aegypti, the right vector, we don't have the same kind of mosquito density. And number three, um, behavioral, social, cultural practices that are permissive. Screens on windows are relatively rare in Brazil. I can just tell you that in hotels, it just doesn't happen. Uh, air conditioning is relatively rare in many parts of Brazil um, and in many parts of Latin America. The virus is probably moving even between you know, cities and countries inside people, not inside mosquitoes. Then once it gets to a community where there's an established Aedes aegypti population, then the person who is sick is bitten by a local mosquito, the virus develops in the mosquito and then starts getting passed around. There have been many, many cases of Zika in the U.S. that are related to travel. So The primary mosquito that transmits Zika virus is the Aedes aegypti mosquito. It is a floodwater mosquito, so it's one of our native mosquitoes here in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, it's an urban mosquito, and so basically it lives amongst people. You're not going to see them out in the desert or anything like that. They can lay their eggs, and the eggs can dry out for extended periods of time. Then when rains come during the monsoon season or over winter, those eggs can immediately hatch and they come out as adults about a week later. So the egg stage can last an extended period of time. Uh, they emerge as larvae for about a week. They pupate over about two days, and then they become adults. And they're found, mostly they're container breeders, so they're found in small pots and basically small pools of water that they can find in various places, usually associated with people. What exactly are the factors that make the Aedes aegypti mosquito competent to carry the virus? It's not as simple as the insect gets infected blood and then they spit that infected blood into someone else. If that were the case, then all kinds of diseases would be affected by mosquitoes. So it's a really close biological relationship between a particular mosquito and whatever that microbe is. If you have the mosquito ingest a blood meal that's infected with the virus, it has to migrate into the mosquito midgut, and then it has to be um, able to go and migrate back to the salivary glands where then it can reach high enough viral titers to infect the next person. They're probably living about three weeks on average, at, actually at most, many of them won't even survive that long. And this is really important because it does take these viruses time to get through the mosquito. So it's those oldest mosquitoes that are responsible for most of the disease transmission. Aedes aegypti loves human blood. Most mosquitoes actually don't like it that much. This is um, a mosquito that has, a, has the biological connection to Zika for whatever reason that allows Zika to replicate inside it. And it's a mosquito that likes to bite people. So the two of them together make it a really strong vector. There's been uh, a possibly a link to blood transfusion, sexual transmission is present in the saliva, in the urine. Um, and, and so really most of the efforts right now are focused on prevention, uh, specifically, especially for women, uh, avoiding if they can, if they're pregnant, uh, uh, traveling to areas with Zika transmission. Um, also very important about how to protect yourself from mosquito bites, so all the different measures that you can take to protect yourself. And all we can tell people is, you know, educate the public, do source reduction, um, encourage people to use repellent to, to avoid getting bitten by mosquitoes, to see the mosquito bite is more than just annoying, that it's potentially dangerous. So some of the standard ways that people have been trying to control the vectors are through um, source reduction, and source reduction means telling people to empty their standing water so that you don't have places where these mosquitoes can lay their eggs. You can also do uh, spraying, so you can do the, the ULV spraying, which is the trucks that are going down the streets 
and doing um, ultra low volume spraying of different pesticides. There's aerial spraying that you can do both of sort of adulticides which kill the adults as well as larvicides where you can have aerial BTI. Um, and then there are some more sort of novel innovative controls that are just sort of starting to, to be developed. So um, there's the genetically modified mosquitoes, the OX153A by the company from Oxitec. That's a you know, mosquito that when you have a wild type female that mates with the genetically modified male, then they lay eggs, but those eggs won't develop to an adult stage. However, the practice of these control measures might create additional struggles. Anytime you have a community level treatment, you're going to have potentially a small pocket of the population or maybe even a large pocket of the population that doesn't actually want that intervention. And I think you've seen that in the, in the news. There's been protests about the, the spraying and how it's killing some of the bee populations. Anytime you spray an insecticide, there's going to be non-target effects and there can be human health effects. So that's, that's a concern. Pretty much all the products that are, are useful or available are neurotoxins. And one of the th things that humans and insects have very much in common is our nervous systems. If it, if it affects the nervous system of a mosquito, then there's the potential for it affecting the nervous system of a person. Now, the amount of insecticide that you know, humans would be exposed to is very, very small. Um, and the products that are used now are ones that are very short-lived. In fact, they're so short-lived, sometimes you know, they, don't, they don't do enough. The other issue is non-targets. So things like honeybees, depending on what you're spraying and where you're spraying it and when you're spraying it, you can affect all sorts of other insects. None of the products that are used right now to kill adult mosquitoes are specific to mosquitoes. Some of the products for the larvae are very specific, which is why they're, they're really great. But for the adults, it's pretty much, it's going to affect you know, other insects as well. And so I think some of the key ethical questions are, What's the level of community buy-in that you need before you start implementing these large-scale uh, community-based projects? And who should decide that? So is it a referendum on a ballot? Is it a group of um, you know, decision makers, po po political, uh, political folks who are deciding whether or not these things should go forward? Should it be the public health community strictly? And how much does each person's decision weigh into what the ultimate outcome is? Because of the limitations of diagnostics, really uh, what the CDC has stated is that the testing should be really for mainly for women, pregnant women uh, uh, who have come in from areas. Uh, in, in, for example, for men, it's not uh, recommended at this point. The vast majority of adults who come into contact with Zika virus have absolutely no um, bad effects. That's part of the reason why we're so amped up about trying to really target it on the demographic that we believe has the greatest, um, the greatest risk and, and the greatest potential for harm. The, the president asked for funding uh, for, or for development of vaccines. So I think there's a sort of a global um, really push with the World Health Organization, now the Centers for Disease Control, and within these nations themselves, um, uh, increasing research in understanding this disease better. The question is how long will it take researchers to develop a vaccine to prevent Zika? We're going forward into getting vaccine trials. No therapy yet at this point. Um, diagnostics are, we're using the same diagnostic tools as we were using. Yeah. Testing um, now available. So we have a PCR that can be obtained for Zika virus. And again, if it's negative and there's a concern that the, the person may have Zika, uh, serology test, uh, uh, IgM, ELISA can be ordered as well. Um, there so is now um, uh, one vaccine that's already been uh, experimented in, in live, you know, uh, individuals and uh, it's been pretty effective in dengue. So some people are, some of the scientists believe that they may be able to use this live attenuated vaccine for the development of Zika since it's, you know, they're similar, they're a flavivirus. Um, there's also development of a phase one in mice that's showing some promise, but from mice to humans is a huge step. You, of course, you don't want a vaccine to be um, effective, but yet harmful to the public. So you have to go under rigorous testing before you can, you know, take those chances. But with the news that also this virulence may be sort of cooling down a bit. Vaccine development is a slow process. 
um, and we probably are still about two years out from a vaccine being commercially available. That, in the grand scheme of things, is really quick by drug development standards, but will be past the crest of what we're dealing with now to have a meaningful impact. So it will all depend on the, the processing and approval and then the scientific governing bodies that make recommendations, who should get it, what age, you know, what groups, who cannot get it, when, you know, all that stuff comes out after further studies are done. The Summer 2016 Olympics were held in Brazil. As predicted, many athletes and visitors were concerned with the epidemic. There's been a few things in the news with the Olympics in Rio. A few of the golfers decided not to, and some people are saying it has something to do with financials and not really Zika. We're not really sure. I think a famous tennis player is now not going to be playing uh, as a result of Zika. So and more information, I think, as, the, as we get close to the, the Olympics. We're going to hear. Well, I would say if you're, a, if you're a woman who's pregnant, you should not be attending the Olympics. If you're going to attend, you should probably not try to attempt pregnancy at least for three months after your return. That's if you're completely asymptomatic. If you're symptomatic, then for six known months. known cases, but I know that Brazil took a lot of steps to try to limit the exposure. And I think a lot of it had to do with education. Of course, some, some countries decided to pull out. So, so, and I think it was also the timing of the year, the season maybe, and all these efforts led to um, really no major outbreaks as we know. There was an editorial to the Lancet um, that said that this is a travesty, that the game should be postponed, and it was, it was signed on to by a variety of, of, of eminent scientists. That just didn't materialize. You know, the one of the biggest challenges you can face with any emerging infectious condition is whether you have the resources necessary to respond in real time. We've got a plan over the next uh, several months uh, to begin developing a vaccine uh, and to continually improve our diagnostic test. That was a big challenge that the White House issued, initiated from the moment it got started. State and local governments were telling uh, Congress and others we lack the resources to respond to yet another new emerging threat on the heels of H1N1 and Ebola. It's patently unethical for a country to sit and watch a emerging condition like this impact infants and pregnant women and others across the country, and globally for that matter, meanwhile literally sitting on our hands and watching as these uh, potential resources that could have been highly efficacious in regards to responding are simply unfunded on political grounds. Because of the economic situation in Puerto Rico, they have really de-invested in the public health infrastructure, and they are finding themselves in a world of hurt. Um, there are very few places that people are able to go to access free contraception, for instance. Which, what's the big deal? Well, if you don't want to have a bunch of babies with microcephaly, you got to have contraception. Congress needs to do its job. Fighting Zika costs money. Helping Puerto Rico deal with its Zika crisis costs money. Research into new vaccines. And by the way, NIH just announced the first clinical trials in humans. That costs money. And that's why my administration proposed an urgent request for more funding back in February. Not only did the Republican-led Congress not pass our request, they worked to cut it. And then they left for summer recess without passing any new funds for the fight against Zika. Without sufficient funding, NIH critical trials, uh, clinical trials and the possibilities of a vaccine, which is well within reach, could be delayed. Why do we always essentially seem to keep chasing our tail with these things? Where Ebola happens and, oh my gosh, let's get a lot of money and try and solve it. And, oh, now Zika is happening, let's you know, take from the Ebola money and try and you know, fix Zika now. Um, and I am arguing, and I think a lot of people in the public health community would argue that we really need to put things in place that are solid um, um, infrastructures to be monitoring these diseases and their potential for emergence globally because these kind of global emergence events as we have had a more interconnected world build over the past several decades, we need to be able to understand what's going on. On September 29, 2016, Congress finally passed the Zika funding bill providing $1.1 billion to continue the work on vaccine development, 
studies on the effect on unborn babies, as well as helping to control mosquitoes that carry and spread the virus. So why is it that we've had a single case of microcephaly in Puerto Rico versus all the hundreds of cases in Brazil? So what is it that might be a cofactor that allows this neurotropic virus to be as um, potentially dangerous and, and injurious as it is? But, it, but it's clear now that the virus seems to persist in the baby even after postpartum, even into its early um, development. Um, and, so, and so microcephaly becomes kind of the most extreme end of a spectrum of neurologic um, kinds of consequences of that exposure. Um, and I think we're just now beginning to learn what that spectrum looks like, what the rest of the spectrum looks like. So I think, um, I think we're in for some interesting times still. So the types of questions that we still continue to see, and they're going to be profound ones, are the recommendations we're starting to see from public health and other types of officials about what to do in relation to Zika virus. These present really difficult legal issues. FDA recently issued a recommendation for all blood supplies in the United States to be tested for Zika virus. We don't have the capacity to do that right now in the United States. We're working on it, and it is being developed systematically. But what happens legally? when a particular blood sample gets out there into, the, um, you know, into uh, a particular medical scenario and infects an unknowing person with Zika who then may impregnate another person, oh, the issues legally from a liability perspective are really quite difficult. Some of the questions that, that I'm really interested in is what is going to be the impact? So microcephaly is sort of a, a very sort of obvious outcome of um, Zika virus infection during pregnancy. But what is happening to individuals who don't have babies with microcephaly but were infected during pregnancy? Um, what's the spectrum of sort of developmental delays that we might see as these babies are born and as they sort of grow up? And then also, um, is there a window of sort of time after a baby is born and maybe even in sort of that first year of life, if, if they get infected, the, the brain is still rapidly sort of developing during that period of time. Is there a better way to do spraying of insecticides to actually really pinpoint the mosquitoes that we want to and actually kill them as opposed to, right now it feels like sometimes some of the spraying is more to just show we're doing something. There's clearly a utility for, for spraying insecticides when you have a big outbreak but what's the right way to do it so that you minimize you know, human and non-target exposure but actually knock down the infected mosquito? We, there are a whole bunch of questions about Zika uh, that are, are, I think, really important and really um, relevant. Just how much of a role is sexual transmission in terms of um, the Zika burden, especially for congenital infection? Right. So, so for instance, so if a pregnant mom in the first trimester or second trimester gets bitten, it's clear that her that that there's a risk to her pregnancy. But what if what if it's not the mom that's bitten? What if it's the dad that's bitten? Does it ha carry the same exact risk? Uh, and I don't believe that we know that uh, answer yet. What I realized, what I think many people had failed to realize, is that we had a hell of a lot more questions than we did answers. Um, and, um, and that even so, in a public health setting, you still have to take action. Even with the limited information that you have, um, you will have to take action um, because that's our job. So. We're learning daily, literally, about Zika virus. And in the last six months, we've learned things about it that have been profound, things we didn't realize before. Its modes of transmission, the potential persons who could be impacted, the full breadth of the impact, the stealthiness of this condition, how easily it can be transmitted for months on end, potentially between male to female. These types of data have profound impacts on how we can respond legally. And the reasons for that is because it really changes the actual nature of the threat. It can implicate different legal responses and raise different legal concerns depending on how significant the threat is and, and how profound it may be. So along the way, 
tying those legal responses back to known epidemiologic effects is one of the biggest challenges we face with Zika virus presently. As we learn more about what is going to happen to the generations of, of children that are sort of born during this vulnerable time period, we may see that there are some cognitive difficulties in a generation of people that are in excess of normal. Um, and so I think we can't really know yet what the impacts are, but you know, certainly there's differential sort of um, infection rates due to poverty, due to ability to protect oneself from mosquito bites, to be able to isolate oneself within their home if they're, if they're pregnant, et cetera. So I think it's going to depend upon where you are and um, what the income level of your country is, what the income level of your own sort of uh, family is, et cetera, how much impact this will actually have, have on you. We learned this in, with HIV. We learned that um, in the beginning of the epidemic, people didn't want to address the disease. Um, they sort of just brushed it off as being something that, um, you know, they, they stigmatized the disease and they said, well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, if you remember the beginning days of the epidemic, people were saying, well, I'm not Haitian, I'm not a drug user, I'm not, um, you know, uh, 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 a, a, a man who has sex with other men, so I'm therefore not at risk. But we learned that uh, it ended up impacting uh, us globally and impacted uh, uh, and, and from what we learned from HIV, HIV, you know, the, the amount we learned about the immune system, about the therapies that we use today, about the grassroots um, approach, you know, that uh, a lot of people unfortunately passed away in groups like as ACT UP who fought, um, they taught the next generations how to get things approved, how to get drugs researched, how to move uh, populations to get approval, um, how the benefit of, of learning the immunology impacted other diseases outside of HIV, other viral infections, hematology, oncology, cancer research. Um, so, um, you know, uh, down the line, uh, if, if, it, if it impacts your whole society or, you know, your global community, it, it's going to indirectly come back and affect you. Two months ago, um, the World Health Organization um, withdrew its um, finding of a emergency, a public health emergency of global importance uh, with regards to the Zika response. What that means isn't that the Zika problem is solved. What it means is not that, that we are, we're out of the woods. What it means is that they're not going to be marshalling those resources because, because they feel that they're at a different place in the in the response. We are just actually gearing up for what we believe will be a very active Zika season uh, during the next year. Um, the reason we believe that is we've had the first 20 or so locally transmitted cases in the state of Sonora uh, in three different municipalities. Um, so we believe that we will be dealing with Zika um, at some level uh, more intensely next year than we are have this year to date. The World Health Organization has lowered the world health emergency status. However, the threat of Zika still continues. While the mosquito travels without boundaries, more outbreaks are expected, and yet no vaccine has been developed. After a year of discoveries, Zika remains an iceberg, with a small percent being known. The fight is not over. Zika is here to stay. <laughs>